Great. Hi. Hi, I'm Tom Cantle. Uh, thanks, Ray. I'm Senior Research Manager at Irrational Agency in London. In today's talk, semiotics becomes an objective quantifiable science. Um, the talk will highlight how small changes can make a really big difference. As we know, behavioural science has made significant inroads into market research in recent years, and we've heard a bit about that from Caroline already. Uh, thinking fast and slow has become part of the lexicon. We see it referenced all the time in papers, studies and conference talks, much like this one. However, it's worth noting that its use in market research has been limited to the analysis stage of quant or qual research projects. On the other hand, semiotics has been relatively immune to behavioural science, even though the study of signs and symbols have, has a lot in common with it. Perhaps this is due to its artsy humanities heritage. But today, I'm going to show you how behavioural science can supercharge semiotics. But before that, let's get some de definitions in place. What is this thing called semiotics I'm talking about? Well, an established definition is that it's a study of sign systems and how meaning is made. Basically, it's the study of how you understand meaning from everything around you. The interpretive nature of it guard grounds it very much in arts and humanities. Most semioticians, for example, I've met uh, have a background in literature like me. Traditional semiotics does not rely on consumer data, quant nor qual. Instead, in the commercial sense, it looks at popular media, packaging, brands, and things like that as a context for analyzing a specific brand slash uh, product. Just to note for any semiotics buffs out there that we are broadly favoring the Sasurian model of semiotics rather than the Persian. Let's give an example of how this works to make it real. Uh, here's an example of a sign. It's, of course, a tulip. Uh, the denotation, um, as in the literal meaning of what a sign is, is the first layer of semiotic analysis. Uh, here's what Wikipedia says a tulip is. It's a herbaceous herb. I always like that. Uh, that's the denotation of a tulip. Um, but that's just one layer. What you associate with the sign is the second, more important layer. This is connotation. Um, so you may have seen a tulip and you may have thought of some Dutch references, for example, uh, the flag, you know, the words, the Netherlands, uh, the windmills, the clogs, tulip fields. Um, we also have some references to spring, maybe. Um, but we can also have more personal references, too. So I think about my favourite footballer, Dennis Bergkamp, going against Argentina for Holland in 1998. Uh, you can see my passport there. I was born in, in Holland. Uh, so I associate um, lots of early memories of Holland, for example, my first ever house. And of course, there's the uh, part of the, it's a small world ride at Disney, which I remember from my childhood and I, I uh, always have really fond memories of. So that's quite an abstract example. Let's move on to something which is more uh, directly relevant to market research. If we're going to look at packaging and conduct a semiotic analysis, we'd look at quite a few things. These are on the left. Um, for example, the brand typeface, uh, logo design. Uh, let's have a look at a logo aspect. Here's a sign. It's, of course, a leaf. Uh, in the old days, um, I'd be on the stage, so I'd be able to ask people, what does this mean? Uh, but people have told me in the past, this kind of means friend freshness, mintiness. Does anyone, uh, can anyone think kind of where this leaf comes from? Where, where have you seen it on a brand before? It's on the Tropicana bottle. Um, so it's not probably nothing to do with uh, menthol or, or, uh, or uh, mintiness at all. It's more to do with freshness, perhaps. But you can see straight away that symbols can be interpreted in, di in lots of different ways depending on context and small differences can mean a lot. This diverse range of things um, shows a few of the troubles that semiotics faces. The first is that it's highly subjective or we'll answer based on my own personal experiences. Uh, there's ample time to rationalize answers and interpret them accordingly. And either way, um, you know, you've got infinite options to interpret what you might think is a good answer. There are lots of drawbacks for, um, in, in summary uh, with pure semiotics. Let's have a look at the, each of these in detail. First up, first up subjectivity. Uh, semiotics can have some issues if you look at the uh, semiotician himself uh, through the lens of behavioural science. Egocentric bias, uh, we see our beliefs as more common than they are in reality. So if you're doing um, semiotic, uh, semiotic analysis on your own, you may believe that um, something that you think is true is more true than it is to, uh, to the wider public. And there's also confirmation bias. So imagine that I find a theme that I really like. I could praise this bias, um, favoring further information that supports that theme, whilst ignoring ignoring things that say the, the opposite. So our leaf uh, can be mean menthol to me uh, due to the fact that I remember it um, 
on chewing gum, which I have a lot. They may not mean that to you. As I said at the beginning, thinking fast and slow has become part of the market research lexicon. With regard to semiotics, it's very much stuck, as we see here in the slow lane. With unlimited time to rationalize, any possible association could become valid. Um, my leaf um, could mean memfo, which could speak to the idea of freshness, um, and that could therefore link to, uh, to, to Tropicana. Uh, that's quite a tenuous link, but you can rationalize it out if you have enough time to do so. So this infinite option for interpretation has been known about for a long time. Umberto Eco uh, said here, we can imagine all cultural units as an enormous number of marbles contained in a box. By shaping the box, we can form different connections and affinities among the marbles. Um, so you've always got the ability to make anything linked to another thing without a guideline or a framework in place. Given the issues we've identified, um, how can uh, this be helped? Well, uh, science to the rescue. Uh, in the form of cognitive semiotics. So cognitive semiotics integrates the substance of cognitive sciences with the substance of semiotics. And it's actually a real transdisciplinary area of academic study, by the way. It combines semiotic analysis, like we've just seen and done, with experimental and ethnographic approaches. As we see in this Venn diagram, cognitive semiotics sits between the world of semiotics and behavioral science. As we've seen, semiotic studies signs, symbols, and meaning. The researcher or semiotician tends to figure out the meaning alone and doesn't really take into account consumer experiences. In contrast, behavioral science studies non-conscious influence, amongst other things, and uses mixed methods to help quantify analyses and allows the consumer uh, to have a perspective, making it more objective. Cognitive semiotics then helps us uncover the mental architecture of meaning and does this by examining the mental shortcuts embedded in science and language. Looking at things through this lens then, the signs and symbols and semiotics become the visual shortcuts that help us navigate the world around us. These can be called heuristics, um, which are the mental shortcuts which help us deal with the overwhelming amount of information that comes, that comes at us on a daily basis. The mental architecture behind these heuristics tends to be rooted in your childhood. You see a red traffic light, you know from an early age that it means stop. Uh, but mental meaning uh, continues. So a red traffic light could mean you know, a red light for a race if you're an F1 fan. Or maybe the traffic light's in your house, or maybe you know, the red traffic light which meant you failed your driving test. In any case, all of these things take a lifetime to build an associative network, but they're activated in an instant, thinking fast. We need cognitive semiotics to help us explain the fast and slow part of the human brain. The amount of information we receive on a daily basis is staggering. Your brain is constantly at work. Visual cues tend to dominate decision making because it's often the first sense to activate, especially when buying products. That's what you normally see, but you normally see something first before you act. That's why this presentation is focused on visual cues. That there are lots of uh, examples of other senses being activated. For example, in the M&M uh, store in central London, they pipe in the smell of uh, chocolate, even though uh, M&Ms are sealed. So obviously, they don't smell of chocolate just to induce you to, to maybe consider buying some. Um, cognitive semiotics, uh, uh, sorry, cognitive psychology studies tend to say that visual activates first. So that's why we're looking at that today. Right, that's all the theory done. Uh, let's try and make this real once more. So qual obviously lends itself very strongly to semiotics, clear synergy, I love doing it, but today we're gonna to be quantifying semiotics. How do we do this? Well, we draw on cognitive psychology experiments to validate our hypotheses about certain ideas, using time response methods to simulate how people think fast and make meaning in the real world. In the example I'm about to show you, we'll be uh, quantifying semiotics through measuring the connotations. So remember that's something that's what something means rather than what it denotes or literally is of shapes and packaging elements. In practical terms, this could be used to give robust evidence for things such as packaging design, MPD and advertising formatting. For this talk, the experiment was to investigate small differences in form like uh, shapes and product packaging created a real difference in terms of the meaning people took out of them. Here's how our panelists would have seen the, uh, seen the experiment this on our own platform. Um, they press the F and J key to say which one of the two things they were te testing they associated the word with. Uh, we were testing, sorry, uh, they associated the word with. We changed the stimu stimuli a few times, and I'll give you the results in a sec. They, were, they had to do this under time circumstances, that's a little bar at the top. Uh, we call this association polarizer. And uh, the words we tested were sourced from several experiments done 
over time by different psychologists dating back to the 1920s. So here's the first set of results. Um, yogurt pot, the yogurt pots for experiment one. And as we see, the more jacket shape is seen as being linked with kind of sharp, sour and citrusy words. And the circular, rounded shape is uh, the opposite with mild, sweet and natural coming through there. Um, this links to uh, evolutionary psychologists uh, who say that maybe uh, the jagged, a jagged kind of shape is kind of a, ha a hazard sign. Think about that. Um, it, it indicates a threat. Whereas a round shape is kind of akin to a baby, a baby's head in one uh, paper I read. Uh, think about safety. And this experiment obviously showed that that uh, this experiment uh, wrought that out, which is is always good. A time difference in look, the square the square base uh, versus the rounded one, created a clear difference in perception to the people we interviewed. Uh, we continue this on to a second experiment. And we looked at the small, uh, small differences in logo design and, and looked into how these could alter perceptions. We changed one thing over three iterations of, um, on the label of an orange juice bottle. In this first experiment, we changed the typeface. As you can see, it's a square one on the left, a handwritten one on the right. Uh, you're probably getting the point by now, but people interpreted the handwriting to connote far more than perhaps, uh, than perhaps um, you might think. Uh, so the more square handwriting was seen as being quite cheap and sharp. The orange juice inside, sorry, was seen as being quite cheap and sharp. Whereas the rounded one tends to suggest a lot of positive things like it is quite expensive, hand pressed, natural, etc., etc. We took the handwritten font forward into the second experiment. Um, in this experiment, we changed the logo again a little bit. Um, with one, we put a segment of an orange. On the other, we put a whole orange to see how that changed perception. And again. Having the whole orange was seen as being a lot better, I, I, I guess, objectively, because things like natural, hand-pressed, expensive and sweet, all, all things you want to be uh, related to your product uh, came through for the whole orange compared to the, the wedge, which just seems to be quite cheap and sharp, which kind of makes sense because it's a bit of a full orange, isn't it? The final thing we did, and remember my little leaf, this is a whole kind of leaf recurring motive through this. Um, we add a little leaf to one of the uh, to one of the oranges in the final experiment, and you know, adding that little leaf again just created that that shift in uh, in perception towards things that are a lot more positive for your brand or the things that you want your orange juice to be projecting. Uh, so, with the leaf again, it was seen as being quite tasty, refreshing, citrusy. And this is clearly a sim simple example of how little things make a big difference, but this if this can easily be upscaled and made more complex to apply to real client problems. So the small things make a big difference. To wrap up, behavioral, uh, behavioral science can supercharge uh, semiotics. This is because, be because behavioral science gives us testable hypotheses and ways to test cons subconscious meanings in a psychologically robust way. It allows us to understand how small changes can make a big difference and ultimately deliver more holistic, robust and usable insights through cognitive semiotics. This allows us to make the subjective objective. Thank you very much.